Hi, everyone. Uh, you should all be able to hear me. Um, check the volume on your computer and make sure that uh, you have the controls. It should be fairly intuitive and fairly simple, uh, but we're going to get going here in a minute or two. We know that we will have another capacity audience today, uh, so I'm just going to give it another minute or so uh, for people to log in. And I really appreciate everyone saying hello. Uh, watching you uh, log in from all over the country, uh, from coast to coast, uh, north to south. So welcome. And uh, we'll get going here in just a minute or two. We also have some visitors uh, from Australia with us, uh, where I think, if my calculations are correct, it's four o'clock in the morning. Uh, so welcome uh, from our friends in Australia. Had the pleasure of visiting you several years ago, and uh, what a beautiful country. And uh, thank you for hosting me, and thank you for being here today. Uh, it's just two o'clock now, uh, and so we will give this uh, just another minute or so. We still have some folks rolling in. Uh, but we do appreciate uh, uh, all of you being here today and the interest that we have seen in these webinars and master classes has been really overwhelming to us. And so thank you. Um, we wondered if uh, we would get some interest and whew, uh, we um, have expanded our capacity to our limits and uh, are still uh, not able to uh, serve everyone. But if for any reason, anyone that you know is not able to log in and hear the webinar uh, live today, there is going to be a recording that is going to be made public uh, and anyone can listen to it. And we're going to make sure that everyone who signs up, even if they don't get logged in today live, will get an email with uh, the connection to the recording of this webinar. So uh, no fears, uh, but we are at 499 people. We have a capacity of 500 live people. Uh, and so if somebody wants to grab the last, oh, there we go. <laughs> so I think we are, are fairly full. So we'll start today. And once again, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you for uh, your interest in the topic. But most importantly, thank you for what you're doing for children all over the country and all over the world. Um, it is absolutely inspiring to me to watch and listen and read about the Herculean efforts that teachers and administrators and counselors are going through to ensure that there is some level of continuity in learning for our students. And um, I've never seen uh, anything like the reimagining and the retooling of education uh, that you have pulled off virtually overnight. Uh, in, in many states, I know that announcements came hours uh, before school was supposed to be in session or hours before perhaps school was closing for spring break. And it caused a lot of people to scramble around. And um, so uh, <clears throat> thank you I, I, on behalf of millions of kids and millions of families who are struggling, who have are facing some trauma. We're all facing some trauma as a result of the situation. Uh, but the, the hope and the inspiration that you're providing is, uh, is tremendous. And so I would be remiss if, if I didn't say that to begin our time today. So let's get going. Um, I want to make sure that you can always contact me. I don't know that I'm going to be able to take any questions off the chat today uh, because of just the sheer volume, the number of you, and the fact that the, ch the chat just keeps scrolling. Uh, the, the questions are probably going to get buried really quickly. So if, if I say something or don't say something or you have a question, um, you can always email me, Steve at drsteveconstantino.com. Um, I answer all my own emails eventually. Uh, sometimes it takes me a little bit, uh, but I'll get back to you. You can also uh, visit our website. And I would also inspire you to tweet anything you want to tweet today. If you want to take a screenshot of something that you think is compelling and put it out there in social media, please go ahead and do that. Uh, we're going to be posting this and letting the world know that this is going to be available to them as well. So thank you for that. 
Our agenda is, is pretty um, rigorous for now about uh, 56 minutes or so. I wanna talk a little bit about the difference between communication and engagement. Um, we'll talk a little bit about a few things before that, but really when we get to the heart of this conversation, I would like to try to clarify, at least from my perspective, the differences between communication and engagement. And then we wanna talk about the role of family efficacy. Some of you may have visited with us on our first webinar, and I think some of you probably may have uh, either participated in our masterclass that last week or are in the process of participating um, in our masterclass this week. If so, then this notion of efficacy is not gonna be new to you, but in the context of today with so many, the vast majority of people on our webinar today are new to us. So we may be repeating a little bit of information for those of you who have been with us a few times. Hopefully you'll bear with us. And then lastly, how do we leverage technology to do all this? I, I don't know how many school systems are using technology. My sense is, is that most of them, most of them are using any available technology to work with students, to communicate with students, to communicate with families and to provide a continuity of learning. Uh, so let's take a look at that technology. I wanna make it clear though, that this presentation is technology agnostic. I'm not gonna be talking about specific pieces of technology because the concepts that I share with you today are universal. Um, whether you're using a social media app or whether you're using a communications device that your school district has uh, uh, provided for you, uh, it doesn't matter. And so this is not a, a, a suggestion of what kind of technology to use, but rather how do you get effect, whatever the maximum effect you can get out of the technology that's available to you. All of the work that I do is built on the, uh, the research and the writing that I've done for many years. Uh, <clears throat> what you see on the screen now is the five simple principles logic model. It's the research model that we use in all of the work that we do with schools and districts around the country. And today um, I'm pleased to tell you that uh, uh, since we started the webinars and we started um, uh, the uh, <clears throat> masterclasses, uh, I have now been able to announce that in September, the second edition of Engage Every Family will be coming out. We hope, we don't think that, that the, uh, the COVID uh, emergency is going to delay that. At least we, we don't believe that's gonna be the case right now. But you're gonna see some subtle changes in, you're gonna see some subtle changes in uh, the new version. You'll, the, the biggest change, of course, is when you look at principle three, which is where we're gonna be living a little bit today. We pr previously would call that empowering families. And what we found through action research and through working with schools and districts around the country is that empower meant different things to different people. And there were times um, when uh, people thought that, some people thought that empowerment meant you know, we were going to do something that was going to be demonstrative or detrimental to schools. And, and that's, that was not the case. What we meant by empower was empowering families to have a role in the educational lives of their children, which really is efficacy. So the big change is we just went with the word efficacy. Um, and, and behind the model, of course, uh, is our changes to descriptions and changes to some of the work that we've done in the past. Today, for today's purposes, we're gonna be living in this part of the model. Obviously, we have to talk about communication and relationships. Uh, we need to talk about efficacy. And those two, how do those two things connect? And can we connect them effectively through technology? That's really where we need to go uh, uh, for today. I wanna remind you too that technology um, has never been, in my opinion, technology has never been a driver of change. I, I see technology more as a vehicle and I see you as the driver. And so our, my philosophy of the work that we do is saying, you know, whatever technology that you use to communicate with families, and we know that technology plays an important role um, <clears throat> Pew Research uh, tells us a lot about technology use in the United States. And every time a new research report comes out, we see significantly higher numbers of people who choose, who prefer to get their information via technology. The number of people who get most of their information off of videos that are two minutes or less, uh, people who prefer texts to telephone calls, people who prefer emails to live conversations. 
The world has changed a great deal with the advent of technology. And we want to make sure, though, that we don't that we don't let technology drive us somewhere, that we use it to get us to where we want to go. A few weeks ago, uh, I published uh, an article and uh, have been working with several organizations around the country since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, many states and many organizations are writing continuity plans and trying to help schools, local schools and local school districts grapple with the, the immense amount of issues that are out there. And um, I offered some considerations for us to think about as we move through, the, through this crisis and beyond. Uh, what does what does school look like when all of this is over? And so I want to take just a couple of minutes and, and go over this really quickly. This is tangential to our conversation today, but I think I think important. First, uh, I think we need to acknowledge the contextual changes in learning. Uh, over a month, just over a month ago, students were learning in classrooms. Teachers were controlling learning experiences. Teachers were designing those experiences, executing those experiences, and assessing those experiences. And seemingly overnight, the context of education changed. There were no more classrooms, and teachers were no longer uh, uh, having the the front seat role that they have always had. Now. Uh, we have students who are at home who need to stay at home and their families are now um, surrogate teachers. And there's a lot of information, you know, being published and being written about the continuum of success we're having from great successes to not so much. So, again, our hope today is to help engage families in this process because we, we know we want you to be as successful as possible. I think the second thing we need to consider is reimagining the pace of learning. I just think it's going to have to slow down. I can't imagine that we can keep the speed of um, uh, we cannot keep the speed of learning like we did a month ago. I, I really think that we just have to accept that. With many states, uh, the majority of states now have requested and I think have been approved of the waiver from state testing with many states 17 or 18 at last count just calling the year just saying school is done for the year and a wide variety of how schools are dealing with grading and assessment all of those three things suggest to me that uh, learning probably has to slow a bit i think we also need to account for the emotional uh, strain of learning at home both on families and kids and on you uh, this is not easy. And I, I think, too, to temper my comments today, even though we're talking about learning and academic issues, um, I, I can't emphasize enough that job one is to make sure that people are OK. Job one is to make sure that people know you're there, uh, that there's a voice out there, that there is somebody at the other end of a text or somebody at the other end of the phone. Um, we want to make sure that we check in with our families and check in with our kids first. How are you? How are things doing? We want to know if this uh, crisis, this, this illness has perhaps impacted their family. We want to know if parents are working from home or are they part of the critical, critical workforce that are having to go out and work with the public during these very scary times. So much emotion that's attached to this. And, and I can't emphasize to you enough, while this webinar is about academics and learning, you know, what's most important is making sure that people have somebody to reach out to <clears throat> and that you're there for them. We're going to try to give families a more active role in learning. A lot of times families in these kinds of situations are reduced to roles of information where we provide you information one way or we tell you what needs to happen. Your child needs to do X, Y and Z and have it done by so and so time. What we're going to suggest today is that parents become more of part of the process, that, that the planning and design of learning. Uh, in our previous webinar, when we talked about efficacy, we talked about engaging with them in the planning and designing of learning. We don't have time to go over all of that today, but I want you to think about this notion of an active role in learning as opposed to a pass, passive or pass-through uh, role in learning. I think the role of teacher has changed to coach. Um, we have all of these uh, temporary teachers out in the field and uh, they're gonna need a coach. They're gonna, they don't know what you know. They don't have the expertise that you have. And many, and many of them are intimidated by that. Many families don't feel that they can help their children. 
Um, it's our job to let them know that they're doing okay. Whatever they're doing, they're doing great. I, I think that's the best message I've heard. Whatever happens is great. Don't, don't give it uh, <clears throat> uh, too much concern and too much worry uh, at the present time. And lastly, about the landscape. I think the landscape of education has changed clearly, but it's going to change permanently. Um, I've heard some conversations of late about, well, when we go back, when we go back, uh, I don't know that we're going to be living and working and acting in the same manner. Um, after every kind of world crisis there's been, after every crisis that we've had in this country, while we have come close back to normal, I think there's always a difference. Uh, something has always changed permanently as a result of one of these crises. We are doing a great deal of work during this pandemic to reach out, to make sure that we are in touch with people, to make sure that we've built relationships, to make sure that kids and parents are okay, and to make sure that each other is okay. I hope that that spirit continues when school buildings reopen. Uh, we don't wanna go backwards at all. It happens, one of the things to consider about communication um, is that it's my words, my message, and also my values. We have some kind of a mechanism in which this one way ends up being a bit more circular. Something that we want to tackle next. Engagement means uh, that there has been a um, emotional commitment on both parts and that whatever that we're discussing and communicating and sharing has mutual benefit. Um, I see in the chat room that there are some issues with uh, technology and let me see. Um, gonna take one second and check all the, the vitals here. Uh, everything on uh, everything on my end is suggesting that it's uh, it's working. It could be just an internet sag, um, uh, and it uh, my signal is uh, full strength. Everything is supposed to be working. You can try going out and coming back in. I apologize for that. It could just be the use uh, use in the system. We're going to continue on, and hopefully, if nothing else, we'll have the recording uh, that you can you can see and listen to. Uh, subsequent to today. If you look at the quote at the bottom, that the person is engaged is an integral and essential part of the process, I think um, is, is something, doc, uh, Dr. Debbie Pushor, of course, is a, a researcher and professor in Canada, and I've had the opportunity to meet uh, Dr. Pushor, and this, this particular quote um, really does emphasize for me the importance of engagement versus communication. So let's move on to family efficacy. What is efficacy? Efficacy is the power for one or many to produce an effect, uh, to produce an outcome. We want families to feel like they can contribute to the education of their children. But in order for that to happen, they have to believe that they can do it. They have to believe that they have the skills and knowledge to participate in the learning, not just to be an observer or a bystander. If we send a homework assignment home that says, your child should do this and do this, um, you've put me in a role of kind of a bystander, kind of a conduit, if you will, where I just take your information and give it to my child and say, this is what the teacher said you need to do, make sure you do it. Uh, we wanna see if we can't elevate that role a little bit uh, and can we use technology in the process. Take a look at this uh, uh, if you can if you can see it. Um, uh, looks like the reconnecting is working for you. And I apologize, I, I cannot explain uh, why there's a problem today. I can only assume that it's something in the in the internet verse um, that's causing a problem today. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Virginia. Yesterday we had a little issue with the wind, but we shouldn't have any issues today. We have full signal on our side, so we're continuing to monitor it and figure it out. 
take a look at this bullet, if you will. Empowering families um, we, means that we have supported their efficacy level to a point where they become engaged with their children's learning. Um, and it supports a healthy learning environment. School now is maybe the kitchen table or the family room. Uh, in some cases, you know, for families to access internet, schools and churches and other places have opened up their Wi-Fi and people are driving their cars into the parking lot so uh, students can connect. All kinds of uh, courageous stories happening in the country with regard to um, uh, trying to do our best to uh, provide equitable resources for children. So efficacy then equals empowerment. How then the question becomes, how can we empower families? Is there a way that we can design learning to empower families to be part of the process as opposed to maybe just a go-between between teachers and students? In some of the previous uh, workshops and some of the, the previous webinars, we've created what we call the efficacy-based learning checklist. By the way, we're also gonna make a PDF of this presentation available to you. Anybody who registered with an email will get an email from us today uh, <clears throat> with everything you need uh, for the recording and for the PDF of this presentation. What I did uh, in, in preparation for this work is to look into the research of family efficacy, which we've been discussing in some of our master classes. We don't really have the time in just one hour to discuss here, but we've tried to um, uh, distill down uh, some ideas that would be very, we think would be very helpful to teachers in designing lessons that are being sent a distance. We no longer have students sitting in front of us. We can no longer monitor what students are doing. Can we rely on families to become part of it and provide us feedback in the process? And so this checklist, and you can snap a picture of it with your phone if you want to, or just wait for the PDF. Uh, this isn't a secret, this is all yours. But when we're thinking about a lesson, when we're thinking about uh, designing instruction for students who are at home, these six things seem to cover what we need them to cover to promote the efficacy of families. We don't have, a, again, as I said, we don't have enough time in today's webinar to go into the research backgrounds of this, but it really starts with a model that was created by Dr. Kathy Hoover Dempsey and Dr. Sandler several years ago in the 1990s. And we know that when we connect a parent's motivation and a parent's perception of our desire to have them involved in learning, and we also share with them the context of learning, it's the best case scenario for us to then promote their efficacy and leverage that efficacy to support student learning. So these six things, I'm not gonna read them to you, I'm not a fan of reading slides to people, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna be using these six things as I give you examples today of how we could um, use them with technology applications that may be available to you. I wanted to do, I wanted to give you a little history about where technology first met engagement. Uh, in 1989, uh, Dr. Jerry Bach wrote this article called The Transparent School Model, New Technology for Parent Involvement. And you might get a kick out of the fact that the new technology in 1989 was voicemail. I had the privilege of being in one of the research studies in one of the programs that Dr. Brock uh, ran nationally in the mid 1990s and got to meet him and work with him and, and considered him a lifelong friend. Unfortunately, Dr. Bach passed away last summer, but I credit him with teaching me a great deal about family engagement. And in those early days of technology about how we could leverage efficacy with the use uh, of technology, he created what is called, what we know from research to be called the transparent school model. And the technology of the day, by the way, that picture in the upper right-hand corner, if you are really young, that is an old version of a telephone. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I was clear about that. Uh, I did run into somebody uh, recently who asked me what that was. Uh, so I wanna make sure you know what it is. 
when Dr. Bach first conceived this idea, of course, there was no social media. There was no internet. Uh, there were no cell phones. There were telephones and there were voicemail. But he developed a process for teachers that was based on the efficacy research. He had a nine-step process. It's really not important to go into that process. What is important is that he knew that there was a way to promote and leverage efficacy through technology. Teachers were leaving messages for families. Families, they took the voicemail system and reversed it. Instead of people calling the voicemail and saying, hi, this is Steve Constantino, call me. I have a question about my son. Parents and families would call the school and get a message. And the message would be from the teacher about what happened in school that day and what's happening this week and what's important for kids to know and how parents could help uh, support learning. And it was all done in less than a minute. We trained thousands of teachers how to do this work in the, in the late 1990s, and the results were phenomenal. We saw efficacy rates and involvement rates are two and 300% improved uh, just by using technology. So the question then became, could we take these ideas that Dr. Bach created in 1989 and apply them to modern technology? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, I bet if, if Dr. Bach had started his research today, he would find it much more, uh, much easier uh, to promote and leverage efficacy with what we have available to us now, as opposed to what we had available to us uh, all those years ago. So that's really now the kind of the meat of this conversation is that how can we promote family efficacy? Let's review. Efficacy is the power to produce an effect. If we can make learning meaningful and relevant to families, we can leverage their efficacy. When um, uh, they, uh, I had a, a, an old boss who used to say, get a glove and get in the game. Efficacy is giving the parents a glove and allowing them to be in the game, not just watching it. And that's really what we wanna to get to. And that's never been more important than now we find ourselves in this COVID crisis. Um, if, if we didn't think parents were the first and most influential teachers of their children before, we have to understand that that is true and that has never been more true than right now. Parents are controlling the what of learning, the how of learning, the when of learning, the why of learning. And we need to try to influence that, which is why I say think of ourselves as coaches when we are designing lessons. I also want to make sure that I, I tell you something that I say everywhere that I travel when I was traveling um, was this. Family engagement is not about, nor is it ever about doing more. Family engagement is really about doing what we already do differently. So what I'm gonna make, the recommendations and suggestions and some of the ideas that I'm gonna share with you today is, is really not, your, you, we still have to create lessons. We still have to figure out what we want kids to do. I'm not asking you to do more. I'm gonna suggest, however, that if you can apply that checklist and think about these things, we can do it differently. And if we can do it differently and leverage family efficacy, then we should be seeing uh, some better learning, uh, some more consistent learning, more continuity to learning. I don't know that in this crisis we can measure impact uh, successfully, but I do know that we can bring down um, stress levels, bring down anxiety levels, uh, and just uh, get into learning for the sake of loving learning since a lot of the traditional uh, parameters that we have have already been have already been shut down. So when you're using technology, I would encourage you to think about engagement, not communication. <clears throat> it's why I shared that information with you a few minutes ago. We don't want to communicate and uh, just communicate. And what I'm seeing as I review lots of different information is that schools are doing everything in their power to communicate. Dr. Constantino, we're communicating everything. We're giving parents websites. We're giving, you know, we're giving them a lot of information. What's happening is that in some places, in some cases, it's an overload. You know, parents are hearing from, I, I was talking to a, a, a parent online and the parent was telling me that she had three, three children, I think, in three different schools. 
and the text messages coming from the different teachers were overwhelming her. And so one of the things that we need to think about is, you know, can we coordinate how we're communicating with families? Uh, because this, this uh, uh, lady that I was chatting with is an engaged parent. She's actually a teacher herself. And she was really just becoming overwhelmed. And the teachers with all good intentions really wanted to, parents to have this information, but it was an overload. Um, you know, sending parents multiple websites. Here's a list of resources that you can use. It assumes that families know what to do with those resources. In many cases, they just pass it on to their child. So let's see if we can't engage them a little bit more. Let's see if we can't promote their efficacy a little bit more. Um, we wanna make this easy for families. There's enough stress out there. Let's lower that stress level. Let's not, let's not raise expectations. Let's not make this crazy. But we also wanna make sure that we encourage their feedback. The only way that we can check for understanding in the COVID crisis is for families and kids to provide us feedback. We're not there. We may get work turned in. We may not get work turned in. Um, it, the assignments that you are creating for students may require something turned in, may not require something. There's all different kinds of assignments and all different kinds of ways to do this. Um, are we getting feedback? Uh, the example I used to use is a teacher who says to a parent, all they say is, tonight's homework shouldn't take more than 20 minutes. If it takes more than 20 minutes, let me know. And you'd be amazed at the number of parents who said, well, my son was done in two minutes. Uh, my son said he did it in school. Or after an hour, I told my son, you know, don't, don't worry about it. Um, uh, you, you know, your teacher will help you. Little bits of information, you know. I, I, I'm reminded of the old joke: How do you eat an How do you eat an elephant? One piece at a time. Uh, we want to make a curriculum accessible to families who don't know anything about the curriculum. I'm going to explain that to you in a minute, and then we're going to use that checklist that I shared with you to develop lessons that you can send via technology. Now, you could be using video, you could be using um, email, you could be using text. There's a number of apps out there, whether you're getting them free off, off of the, uh, the app store. In many districts, your school district has provided you a two-way communication tool uh, that every teacher has. It's different in different schools. That's why I wanted to make this agnostic because the minute I talk about one specific piece of technology, there's a lot of people who, who will say, well, gee, we don't have that. Really doesn't matter what you have. What you need to make sure is that whatever you're using has a two-way capability. And you don't want to, some of these, some of the apps and some of the technology allows you to send information but not get information back. I would encourage you not to check that box. I would encourage now more than ever, now more than ever, we need feedback of any kind as to what's happening uh, with learning and what's happening with families. Uh, you know, one of the greatest things that I'm seeing teachers write is I'm here for you. Uh, and you'll see us incorporate that into some of the examples we show you here today. So here's some ideas to think about as we move through. <clears throat> so here's our first lesson. Hi class, today's lesson is on finding the main idea. This is an elementary school lesson. I made a short video for you about it here. Watch the video and read the paragraph below. Circle the main idea. Underline the details. Submit your work via email or by using whatever, whatever method you have. I hope all is well. Don't forget we will have our live class this Friday afternoon. And there's the directions. Circle the main idea. Underline the details. And then the teacher provides to the students the, the little paragraph about ocean animals. Do you like sharks? Sharks live in the ocean. You can read that for yourself. So there's the assignment. Main idea, great assignment, um, really nothing wrong with it. Uh, and it, quite frankly, it's a, it's, it's a real assignment. I just have redone it so that we um, don't have identifying features. But let's hold it up to the litmus test of the checklist. On the left-hand side in the gray box, you see the very same assignment that I just showed you. On the right-hand side are those six items in the checklist for designing learning. Does the lesson encourage and welcome families in the learning process? 
I don't know. I don't see it. Do we engage the family as a component of the planning and in the learning process and not a monitor or a compliance role? Do we encourage dialogue and feedback between the teacher, family, and student? Families are not required to learn the lesson to have a role in the learning process. It connects learning with the home learning environment and the learning experience empowers family participation. That lesson, which looked really good two minutes ago, really doesn't meet the mark when we are trying to engage with families and we're trying to leverage their efficacy to support learning at home. We are trying to teach children that we can't see live, that we, we can't work with, we can't do the things that we, we are uh, naturally able to do. So we have to figure out a way to use our surrogates to get us to at least close enough to where we were when we had all of our students in our classrooms. So what I've gone ahead and done is, is that I have redesigned the lesson to see if we can't meet at least some of these criteria. Take a look. I'm gonna give you a minute to read through that um, so that you can kind of uh, process it a little bit. So hopefully you've had a chance to, to read through that assignment. It's the same assignment. Um, it's finding the main idea of a paragraph, which I think is probably in every elementary ELA, ELA standard somewhere uh, across the country. But what we have done with this assignment is that we have now created uh, uh, family efficacy. We've drawn families into the assignment. They may or may not do it. They may read it and say, well, you do it and I'll take a look at it. But we've offered and we've made it optional. We also haven't bombarded them with links. We gave them a link uh, to look at. Here's why you would go to this link. Here's what this link will do for you. Uh, and that puts the link and the, and the, uh, the resource into context for families. So let's, let's take a look now. What I've done, because I knew that we would have a condensed amount of time, is uh, I've put all these arrows in and, and it's, a, it's a little messy, but you get the idea. What I wanted to do was to point out to you um, how we can meet those attributes of the checklist. Now, what the teacher writes is a little bit longer um, because we want to make sure that families understand what the teacher has done in this lesson is she has explained to families what the main idea is. And so if, 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 if I'm a parent who said, you know, it's been a long time since I studied the main idea in school, I no longer need to worry about it. Teacher has already told me there's support for me to learn. There's support for my kids to learn. The teacher has included me. The teacher has invited me. I feel motivated uh, because you know, the teacher has asked me to be involved in this and maybe I won't have time and, and maybe I can't do it this week, but, but the, the goodwill that comes from designing a lesson like this uh, really goes a long way and it's gonna go a long way when schools reopen. Uh, and that's my hope. My hope is that these kinds of ideas will transcend this, this, uh, this crisis we're in and hopefully become normal practice when we get to schools. So yeah, uh, some of you said it's a little longer. And quite frankly, for the purposes of this presentation today, mine is, is all words. Teachers are extremely creative people. Um, you know, I always say that 
it's amazing. You know, we give teachers virtually no money, uh, a box of pencils, a printer cartridge, and a, and, a, and a half a ream of paper, and we say, go crazy. And it's amazing what teachers pull off, uh, largely at their own expense. So I'm pretty confident that somebody could take what I have done, which is a little wordy and quite frankly boring, <laughs> and probably put it into a design that is much more, uh, much more appealing to children and families. But some of the things, you know, notice toward the end, right in the beginning, I hope you are well, I miss you. And toward the end of the assignment, you can do this. Remember, doing your best is just perfect. So there's really all the pressure, uh, all the pressure is off uh, in terms of having to have this, this white knuckling of learning. It's, it's just, in my opinion, and, and if this runs antithetical to your superintendent, what your school system has said, then don't listen to me uh, because I don't want to get you in trouble. But it seems to me that this is not the time to pursue with great intensity the kind of learning we had when schools were open. This is a time to try to build a bridge and continuity of learning. We're going to have a significant slide in learning. And, and we're already starting to think about what school will look like when we reopen. And we don't even know when we'll, 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 we hope the fall. No one has come out and said that's actually going to happen. So we have a lot of things to wrap around our head. I want to uh, take a few minutes. So let me go back real quick. We took this idea, we applied it to the checklist, we rewrote the lesson, same lesson, and then checked to see whether or not it met the criteria of the checklist. It's really very simple. Um, it's not hard to do. And what I have found in working with teachers around the country is that you give them the idea and they run with it. I've been glancing at some of your comments and the chat is moving so quickly, I can't, I can't see it all. But I can see some of you have said, this is very simple. It's meant to be simple. We don't want to send an assignment home that says to parents, please sit down and review the periodic table of the elements with your child. That's, that's not what we're doing. If we need to learn something about the periodic elements, then let's try to break that down into a small piece, something that any parent with any level of education in any situation could understand. There was a story that I saw somewhere and I, I should have captured it and I didn't. Um, it was either on social media or it was in a newspaper, I can't remember, but a teacher had sent home an assignment to create a DNA chain. I, I, I want to say that it was either uh, um, eighth grade science or ninth grade science, somewhere, somewhere in there, or 10th grade, I'm not sure, but it was older students. And the teacher gave uh, directions to the students and families about all the things they had in their house and how they could create this DNA chain. And she said, all I want you to do is create a DNA chain, take a picture of it, and explain to me your DNA chain. And what she got back were all of these wonderful pictures with families and kids, all, you know, pictures of parents lining up ketchup bottles to make sure that it was part of this and part of that. And uh, they were having fun. And, and maybe just maybe they learned a little bit about uh, DNA while they did it. So what we want to make sure is that we understand the context of learning. What do people have available to them in their homes? Uh, and that's why connecting with people and talking with people on a personal and emotional level and building a relationship with people and finding out, do you live in a home in suburbia like I do, where I have, I have a tremendous number of resources available to me? Or are you living in a one room apartment and, and are resources stretched? Are you having difficulty right now because you've been laid off from your job? We, all of those things I really think have to be considered when we are designing lessons. I don't think we can just send stuff home and think that it's, it's, it's going to be successful. Your ingenuity has kept education alive for hundreds of years. And really what I'm asking at the moment is that you apply some of that creative ingenuity that you have as a teacher and really make these ideas come alive. I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure you can do it. So let's talk a little bit about what we have already heard um, 
from families. Uh, we're collecting a little of information um, uh, as we go through the pandemic. And you'll see on the left-hand side of the screen, you know, the things that families are saying are thumbs up. These are the things that they're really enjoying. Um, uh, permission for things not to be perfect. Uh, you know, student directed, more constructivism. In one of the, in one of the uh, webinars or classes I did, we talked about really this is a constructivist approach to education. And if you, you can go back and brush up on constructivism in your uh, educational philosophy books from college, uh, but constructivism is, is participatory learning, is driving and directing learning. That's the kind of learning we're in now. That's, we don't have another option at the moment because we can't see them and we can't be with them, or at least we can't see them in person. Work that's open-ended, creative assignments, relationship building with families, um, opportunities to discuss with the teacher and other parents. Many teachers are just logging into Zoom and having parent coffees where they invite all of the families of the children that they serve just to talk. Don't even talk about school, just, just let parents talk, let them talk to each other, let them tell you what's going well and what's not going well. And, and you know, if people are critical of our efforts, if people are critical of you, just remember that the stress levels and the anxiety levels um, is, is really, uh, uh, really high. And one of the things that uh, if you've been in one of our workshops, I'll often say is remember that anger is a mask for fear. That's never been more true than it is now. If people do become angry or they push back against us, please understand that they're extremely fearful of what's, uh, uh, of what's taking place. You know, the natural instinct of families around the world is that every, every one of us who have children want our children to exceed us in their quality of life. Parents see this pandemic as a tremendous threat to that. And the only thing that's going to calm that threat is you, your compassion, your ingenuity, and your ability to build relationships with people, uh, and your ability to solve any problem in the world. Teachers are, teachers are heroes. And, and if we can apply that personal touch to this, the rest of it is going to go a lot easier. On the flip side, on the right-hand side, um, parents get very jittery when we communicate uncertainty. One of, the, one of the responses we got back was a teacher who said, well, this is what you're going to do until we get more clarity about what's going on. I understand what that teacher meant. There is no clarity. Teachers were, were scrambling, probably still are scrambling uh, to figure this out. Well, I don't know that we, you know, parents probably can figure out that, that we're scrambling. I don't think we want to suggest uncertainty to them because that uncertainty with them will magnify. Uh, um, and so remember, uh, anger or, or stress is, is a cover for fear. And, and there's, there's really, this is, this is a big fear amongst all of us, quite frankly. In consistent communication, no parent voice, uh, no glove in the game. Parents are recognizing that and, and, and would prefer that they have some better kind of an active role. It's not that every parent will do it. Uh, it's not that things are going to change and become beautiful overnight, but we're creating a different culture. Let me say that again. We're creating a different culture and it's a culture of partnership. It's a culture of relationships. It's a culture of we, we can do this. Um, we need their influence now. They've always had more influence over their children than we have. Now they have it 24 hours a day. We need them if we are going to provide any continuity in learning uh, through this pandemic. So you can see these things. Uh, and again, I don't need to read the list to you. Some of you have had connection problems I'm seeing in the chat, and I'm really so very sorry for that. I, I can't explain that other than some uh, internet snafu. Please remember that anybody who registered for this, whether you saw it or not, whether you got kicked out or not, you're going to get an email from us with uh, a recorded version of it. I don't know what the recording is going to come out like, but you'll get a recorded version of it and you'll get a copy of the PDFs of these slides. So you're going to have all that information to you. And again, I apologize uh, if you got kicked out or there are, there are some connectivity issues today. We're also hearing from uh, folks around the country. In our first masterclass last week, 
we had several people, uh, and I've even listed the states that they were from, Virginia, Georgia, Texas uh, primarily, who have really been giving us a lot of good information about what's working. Uh, these are primarily Title I and family engagement people who believe in family engagement, who are trying to figure out ways in which we can connect learning to family efficacy, because we know that when we do that, we can impact learning very positively. <clears throat> One of my favorite ones is in the second column, the second bullet in blue. We're meeting the family where they are. We're, we are planning with the family, not for the family. We're focusing on their strengths, setting mutually acceptable goals and providing services that are meaningful and beneficial to families. And if my memory serves me correct, that's ex right down the road. I think that's from Virginia Beach, Virginia. I think it's my friend Lakish uh, who wrote that. Um, that one sentence really for me encapsulates what we really are talking about with using technology whether it's an app or whether it's email or, or however we're communicating with, with families. Uh, and you can, you can see these ideas shifting the focus to supporting families who are already disengaged. You know, if a family was disengaged with their child's learning prior to the COVID crisis, there's no reason to believe that they suddenly became engaged once the crisis started. So paying attention to those families that we've always struggled reaching it's probably not a bad plan either. Um, we're going from sharing resources for the sake of sharing to sharing meaningful family resources and support through collaboration. So these are, these are things from the field that people are telling me that's working in schools around the country. And as we collect these, we're gonna to continue to share them with you and continue to, to, uh, to try and roll them out. Before we, uh, before we end today, I want to make sure um, that I share with you uh, one, more, one more thing, and I'm gonna take you to the website here real quickly. When we, um, when we conceptualized, we conceived this idea of putting on these webinars and masterclasses, uh, we had no idea um, uh, what the response would be. We didn't know if two people would want to see it or 20 people or 200 people. The response that we have gotten from you is absolutely mind-blowing to me and to our team. Um, with everything that is going on in your life, with, with all of the stresses of figuring out how to take care of those kids that you love so much, hundreds and thousands of you are logging in, watching the videos, downloading the PF, PDFs, and it's just incredible to me, and I, I can't thank you enough for your interest in, in what you are doing uh, uh, to support this. You know, to have hundreds of people on a webinar when you've got everything else going around you speaks volumes to me about your uh, desire to make sure that kids are okay. And so I thank you for that. Uh, we did this in crisis mode. It was very quick. Uh, we came up with ideas. We put things together. We created the capacity. We figured it out and we launched it. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, you know, what's your plan? And I leaned into the camera and I said, well, I'm not sure going forward what our plan is. What we know now is that our work seems to be resonating and um, uh, we're, we're really hoping uh, that we can be helpful. What I wanted to, and I need to share my screen with you, I think. I just got an interesting thing on my screen, so I'm not sure what you're seeing. I hope that you're seeing um, uh, my website. And if you, if you are seeing it, great. If not, you'll see on the top of the main page, it says online courses. All of the work that we have done around the country for all these years is now available to you online. It takes you to the Engage Every Family online version, and you can learn more, and you'll see that we really are, have uh, our typical training and typical professional development available to schools and districts, just like we always had, but in a web-based uh, uh, environment. We've added uh, master classes uh, for deeper learning for high-performance teams in schools. And I'm really happy that we now are offering a course for those people whose position is parent liaison or, or um, um, there's different names, they're called family liaisons, parent specialists, family engagement specialists, parent involvement specialists. Usually they're funded by Title I in schools and are working with families and teachers. We've designed an entire course 
to help build the capacity of those people so those people could become a nucleus of information uh, in their in their local <clears throat> in their local school systems. So I want to bring you back uh, to to the webinar, and I will also um, I'm, I'm publishing right now. Uh, if if you see a little icon called offers, you can click right on that blue button. It'll take you to what I just showed you. And if you have any interest in doing some more comprehensive family engagement work, um, please let us know. We'd love to to help and work with you. So it's about all the time that we have today. I again really want to uh, thank you uh, for not only participating in this webinar, but thank you for everything that you're doing. You know, every morning I get up and I scan the social media and I scan the I scan media newspapers and and the articles and and the um, What's happening is nothing short of incredible. Uh, no one saw this coming. And, and here we are a couple of weeks into it. <clears throat> and it's absolutely amazing uh, that things are still going on. I saw it, it's something that almost brought tears to my eyes the other day of, of a high school yearbook class getting together on Zoom because they were bound and determined that the yearbook was going to be published. Um, Teachers who were having a math department meeting, I saw on social media the other day, they're having a Zoom math department meeting. One of the teachers was uh, pregnant, and so they had a baby shower on Zoom. So what's happening is just incredible, and it's all you. It's all your ingenuity, but it's really your compassion and your caring for kids. So I really do appreciate that. I know we uh, in our organization appreciate the work that you do, and it's always a privilege for us to be able to work with you. So with that, I will say thank you so much for um, coming to the uh, uh, webinar. Thank you for your interest. And uh, if you are interested, next Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock is the third of our three webinars. We're going to be talking about family academic socialization. That's a mouthful. Uh, but we'll explain that to you, and hopefully we'll give you some more good information that will assist you as you move, uh, move through this process. So I want to thank you, everybody. God bless you for the work that you do, and I hope to see you real soon. Take care. Bye-bye.